Okay. Um, welcome back, Sagar. Uh, we're back on Reinventing Hinduism, uh, episode two. Uh, this time, hopefully, we'll actually talk about Hinduism. Um, I think last time we had a very, very good and interesting discussion about a lot of stuff, which might be more like almost like complex systems, you know? And I think what's interesting about that is it's probably the reason why we're interested in this topic as well. Um, like the world is a complex place, we want to understand it. Um, and, uh, and so, so that kind of led us where we, uh, where we went. Um, yeah, today I was thinking we could talk a little bit more about, uh, you know, a lot of research comes out uh, from uh, genetics and archaeology and all these places uh, about the Indus Valley civilization, which is the group of people who lived in what is more like the Western India and modern day Pakistan about 3,000, 4,000 years ago. Right. Um, no, sorry. It's more than that. Five thousand years ago, and the big question is like, who are who were those people? Right. Um, genetically, ethnically, linguistically, we don't know very much about them, um, and this is a controversial topic uh, in in India, and I think it ties to Hinduism. Um, so, what I want to know first off is just like, what's your theory? Who do you think those people were? I I think I believe in the current academic consensus. And I have gone back and forth on this, but um, if there is one easy view to state what I believe, it's what Razib Khan talks about the steppe people, mm. right? So the Caucasus Mountains, some people came in from there, they settled in the country uh, that today is called India and earlier used to include the land masses of Pakistan and Bangladesh. And uh, I think, and Afghanistan, modern day Afghanistan. Uh, so that I believe they came roughly from the Caucasus Mountains uh there's definitely an overwhelming sign that they were a single tribe mm. right and they have then they came into this landmass settled it in various things and there were existing populations and they intermingled or whatever there were battles mm -hmm. uh and uh, as well but but yeah so i think i roughly agree with the academic consensus now mm -hmm. for a yeah. while um for the western academic consensus because there are indian academics who believe in what is called the out of india theory Mm -hmm. For a while, I entertained that quite heavily myself because I didn't know how to interpret certain evidence coming out of India, right? So mm -hmm. archaeological and genetic. Mm -hmm. And when I say believe, it's a very it's a very loose sort of belief, right? I think roughly the Caucasus model makes more sense than the out of India model today. Mm -hmm. uh, but for now, the evidence points me towards the Caucasus model. Yeah. So what you're talking about specifically is the Aryans, right? Like what we yes. call what we call Aryans, um, and the and they sort of herald the rise of the Vedic civilization. Um, right. I'm I'm, I'm interested in about the stuff that came before, right? The Indus Valley civilization mm -hmm. that with which these Aryans mingled and then created the the Vedic civilization. Um, that very very early on one. Um, do you have any theories about that? I actually don't believe that model itself. Like, I don't believe mm. that the Indus Valley is projected to be because the, one of the problems is that no, okay, again, I, I, I use the word belief. It's just that it's really hard to know because we don't know. I mean, what's the uh, we don't know anything about the Indus Valley civilization. That's the problem, yeah. right? Yeah. We don't nothing about these people. We don't know the language they spoke. We don't have a genetic trace. Uh, we can say that some groups of people existed at the time, but I literally have no theories. They they might mm -hmm. as well be Adivasis in the traditional Sanskrit word, right? Adivasi, mm -hmm. like the, mm -hmm. the the person who has been there since I'm before more, time. Right? Yeah. Exactly. So that's the idea. So they were Adivasis, and I don't find that because there is no evidence. I don't um, I don't have much theory because even my theory requires at least some bit of evidence, right? Yeah. So they they they, they sound like the Sea Peoples. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so there's always like, um, you know, history is fascinating because there's so much dark matter, right? Um, in the sense of, you know, something happened there, but you can't really go past that. You can't say much more than like, yeah, people lived there. They did stuff. They interacted with other people. Um, they probably had a lot of parties and, you know, um, uh, marriages and births and deaths. And that's about all you can say about them, right? Um, and, uh, and and I think that um, part of what, uh, what people try to do when they look back at history is they see like, oh my God, so much is lost. You know, like 99% of evidence is just sort of erased um, and, uh, or not even erased, it's just discarded and disintegrated. And so I think what people try to do often is like um, in that dark matter, they see uh, their hopes, 
right? <laughs> so they, they, they see what, um, so that, that's what I was trying, sort of trying to get at, which is like, um, is there, like, is that important to you, right? And, and it sounds to me like, no, that's not that important to you. It's almost an academic question. Right about whether the Indus Valley civilization was like, you know, were, were speakers of uh, Austronesian languages or whether they were speakers of Dravidian languages. Like it, it doesn't that, like that's not interesting. Um, what is what is interesting is that like these this uh, particular type of debate about who was the creator of this particular civilization. Um, this seems somewhat unique to India, in the and I think and I think it gets into a bunch of other stuff. So, so I, I have never heard. And this might be my own ignorance, but I've never heard of people in uh, Europe, you know, finding like Neolithic ruins and saying like, oh yeah, like it was definitely English speakers who built those Neolithic ruins. You know, it's got to be. Um, they they're sort of more accepting of the idea that okay, maybe it was maybe it was some people who came before, but whatever, we came and we supplanted them, and now we're the ones here, right? Like, yeah. But is it what, what do you think is it important to you this i i actually disagree with the fact that this is important in india i think it became important in india funnily enough it's connected to what we tried to talk about in the first podcast which was mm -hmm. the german indologists mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. i actually don't like is there any attempt before that in indian in indian history say 1800 years after like in the common era about indians trying to claim that you know I don't I don't recall or maybe I just don't know are there any debates before that because my theory about that is it only really became important because of the Brits and the German Indologists yeah before the, that, they didn't care before so I mean the discovery of Harappa and Mohenjo-daro uh, this the archaeological sites was a was a European discovery right so I think the sites right. were known they were known to be old and they were like sort of abandoned and people knew what they were but they were not really considered as part of like the uh the storytelling of the people who lived there they weren't like oh yeah yeah, we used to live there and we no longer live there now like that that wasn't the story that like say punjabis told of themselves uh back then right um and and i think that that particular bit of mythology um so yeah i guess the the, the british are responsible for some of this for sure right um yeah. they came in it was a big part of their myth making right and their need to say like oh this advanced civilization here there's no way it was it came out of nowhere it must have come out of sun like our it come, must have come out of us right it must come out yeah. of Europe. um there's a sort of interesting example of uh, of that in africa as well where there's a place called great zimbabwe uh i don't know if you've heard of it but uh great zimbabwe was a, a, a city right and it was a city in zimbabwe and um the british archaeologists who discovered it and sent notes back to the london historical society or whatever um they were uh they they were like oh we discovered a city um it must have been you know logic says it must have been built by africans and then the letter comes back that says like you can say it was built by anybody the chinese um <laughs> the russians but it cannot have been built by africans you know like there's just like so counter to the racial uh, ideology of um of the british uh of the british empire right um, which is the core part of what it core of what it was um so i think yeah that you're right that it's uh maybe a colonial holdover right um, well, it's a colonial holdover given um like it was catalyzed further by the modern political dravidian movement in india mm, interesting. Right? So like the, it was the rise of the dravidian identity more than anything that has brought up these questions and uh and, I, and the framing has become poisoned you know this mm. frame has now become poisoned you cannot touch it uh even though these are fantastic questions and we should just accept the answers like there is a world in which let's say that the harappan civilization was a purely dravidian speaking civilization mm -hmm. right and then there is a theory that the aryans came and they drove them out mm -hmm. right sure okay they drove them out and then what like okay and then we settled and but now we have india mm -hmm. like what like what is the meaning of that like you know there was the yeah. punjab empire and before that who was there like so what you know so I, I want to, I wish I could bring up this WhatsApp content right now, but I'm sure you've seen it. There's always some WhatsApp forward, which is like uh, Sanskrit, or you know, depending on what your family is, uh, Sanskrit or Telugu or Tamil are the mother of all languages, right? <laughs> they're, they're, it, is, it is the originator of all yeah. things. Um, and, and that's something which like, like, I don't think anybody tries to say that English is the origin of all languages. Like that's, that's like a, <laughs> yeah. you know, and, and it is, it is one of those things where like, it happens often enough where I think, and I think this is what you're saying. It's like the frame is poison because the frame is, oh, we are older. 
you know, we are older yeah. and therefore we're more legitimate. And that seems to be a very common frame um, in discussions of like what makes Hinduism Hinduism, right? If it's like the older something is, it's like, okay, that's what, that, that's what makes it more legitimately Hindu in a way, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that is a fiercely traditionalist. That is, that is literally returned to tradition, you know, yeah. like to type of mentality. Um, so I guess the question is like, what does it look like uh, to, what does it look like to have, uh, have discussions which are not about like, what is the oldest thing, right? But rather like what yeah. Hinduism can bring to the world or what Hinduism can bring to our personal lives, you know? Or has brought already. Or has brought already, yeah, 100%. So like, uh, just before this discussion, no, I mean, I, now I try to prep in my own way. And that's partially why I completely zonged on your first question. I have no idea why I heard Aryan when you said Indus Valley. I have mm -hmm. no idea. But, yeah. I, but before that, I spent a few hours. So do you know the Bhandarkar Oriental Research Institute in Pune? No, I do not. So it's, uh, it's a fascinating institution. And funnily, it still has the word Oriental in it, right? You're not mm -hmm. supposed to use the word Oriental in it. But it's an Indian institution. It's, it's started by a man called Bhandarkar. And, you know, he's a Maharashtrian and it's in Maharashtra and it's a very fiercely traditionalist uh, scholarly institution. Like it is actually one of the few Indian scholarly institution whose actual sole purpose is uh, it, it started with, I think, the Mahabharat, like getting all the versions of the Mahabharat together. There's a technical term for it, but then they expanded their scope. Right. So I was, in fact, I was listening to and there's a fantastic lecture. It's available on YouTube. It's called From Vedas to Vedangas. Right. And uh, this is by a scholar at the Institute. And she is giving the very like, you know, she's saying the same words that could have come out of a British historian at any time. So which mm -hmm. which a lot of Indians today don't like, mm -hmm. you know, but they don't like it because it has this association with British colonialism. If you just forget, like, just keep it on one side. But this thing, what Hinduism has brought to our lives is, and this also ties back into your older or like Hinduism, the language question, like even say, you know, the Rig Veda is dated to somewhere between 3000 to 5000 years, right? Like conservatively scholars say 3000 years and 5000. So like if you read the Rig Veda and specifically, so the first about one hour is dedicated specifically to the Rig Veda and then the Atharva Veda, right? And like uh, we, we, as I say, we so loosely because I, I, I don't know how to associate us with them, right? I, I, I've struggled with this particular framing quite a lot. Uh, I've had to think about what does being part of a tradition mean, mm -hmm. right? Because you are a Hindu, I am a Hindu, yes? And being part of Hindu uh, means that the role of the Vedas is quite central to your belief system. Like people like to say that Hinduism and this and that, and it's like a let a billion flowers bloom. That's not true, right? You're just making shit up. Like it's, it's Western liberalism. Mm -hmm. Like there is no traditional Hindu who denies the following things. The central importance of the Vedas and the Mahabharata and the Ramayana to the core of your belief system. And when I say the core mm -hmm. of your belief system, it's like how you view the world, the society you live in, and your role in that society, you know? And then the, then the discussion about Dharma, like Dharma, like what is the way, your way, your role, etc. right? Mm -hmm. in, the, in the Vedas itself, first of all, you will see, notice a few traits, right? The obsess, obsession with words, right? Like there's an obs obsessiveness in Sanskrit and then the later Paninian reforms, but even before that, like Rig Veda is pre Panini, right? And you can see that how they structure the words, how they collect the words, how the meter is distributed, how the rhymes are said. So, you know, we've been quite obsessed about language, but coming uh, back to the question of what it means to be a Hindu is, well, who is an inheritor of a tradition? Because in the Rig Veda, uh, Lord Indra, you know, and, and I'm using English words here, but you know, he's, he is a Lord in the sense of, he is the commander of tribes. Indra mm -hmm. is a man in the Rig Veda. He is not a deity yet. Mm -hmm. And Indra comes to the battlefield and he's described as having blonde hair, Hiranya Keshi, right? Mm -hmm. A man with blonde flowing locks with a beautiful chin, mm -hmm. right? Now look at me and you, <laughs> how do we feel connected to Indra? But Indra is a central figure in Hinduism. He later goes on, becomes a deity. So obsession with words, then how do you connect with the tradition? But also the formation of deities. So heroes, very human heroes become deities, you know? And in India, hero worship is a huge thing. You cannot get rid of it. I have, I have no understanding, I hate it. Well, I, I think I think no society has really gotten rid of it. It's just put boundaries around it in different ways. Yes. You look at the way that like people in tech worship Elon Musk, right, or Peter Thiel, yes. right. Um, I see very little difference between like 
I don't know, between that and like, uh, you know, Rajnikant, like it's it's not, uh, I mean, Peter Thiel is a bit more legit than Elon Musk, but like the Elon Musk worship is is like, <laughs> it's, it's very relevant. And, and it gets even more interesting because, um, and this is completely and kind of spitballing here from the comments of another scholar, but like mm -hmm. uh, Indra is the lord of a tribe. If a tribe wins in battle, the leader of the tribe gets to keep a huge share of the spoils. Mm -hmm. You know, this is our modern capitalist equity structure. The CEO gets the majority of the spoils, right? Yeah. So uh, I was just thinking about that. But like, but the, but those are the three questions. Um, they're not questions, but what does it mean to be an inheritor of the tra of traditions? Yeah. And Hinduism has like the things like today. You know, I don't know how many Hindus don't know the Gayatri mantra. Probably after our generation, mm. fewer. But like the Gayatri mantra is recited three thousand years ago. We are saying yeah. the same words that they were saying. Yeah. You know, Tat Savitur. You know, the role of Usha worshiping the dawn. You know, yeah. like so. Are we then inheritors of that tradition? So, I, I, yeah, that's a great question. It's actually something I've struggled with myself for a long time, and I'm curious if you know about the ship of Theseus, the thought experiment, right? That's so like there's a ship. You replace its sails. And then you replace the mast, and then you replace some of the planks, and then you replace it. And slowly you keep replacing pieces. And then the only thing that remains is the name. And you're like, is it really even the same ship anymore? Right. Um, and I think it's a great thought experiment. And like the you, everyone has to everyone has to come to a conclusion about what they, how they feel about that. And the way I feel about it is like, who is part of the tradition? It's whoever keeps it alive, uh, and whoever remembers it and keeps it alive. And like, that's such a, for me, it is a very, uh, it is a very like, um, it's a very generic statement, you know, to be like, oh, to remember things like Wikipedia remembers it. Is Wikipedia then keeping the tradition alive? To me, no, a human being has to be the one who keeps the tradition alive, right? It can't be a machine, it can't be, it can't be something else. And then the other part is like, uh, okay. And then, and then, you know, uh, like memorializes it, remembers it in their own way. Uh, does this mean that like, you know, if you are, if you are just sort of quietly doing it, um, you know, you have, you spend an hour, you spend an hour every week, uh, just sort of sitting in a corner and like flipping through like old, uh, like some, some portion of the Vedas, like, is that enough? Like, yeah, if that's, if that's that person's particular way of doing it, then that's, that's fine. Right. So for me, I feel like to be an inheritor of a tradition, um, uh, is almost just to respect that something much bigger than you kind of like, like produced you, right? And like, like you came out of this much bigger thing and you don't have to go back and like get absorbed into it and lose yourself in it. But you should just kind of respect that that thing was, it's enormous, right? And, um, and, and, and that's all, I think that's all you really have to do. You just have to respect how enormous it is. It doesn't even have to be that it was like, it says produced morally, uh, virtuous things or technological progress or any of those things like to me none of that matters it's just remembering and uh remembering and honoring and i think those are two kind of distinct activities um yeah so i think that's a that's that's my answer to it and i yeah i don't know if like that works for everybody because i think people want different levels of engagement with the material right um and i think that like the reason why so many of these things last for thousands of years is that they have immortal lessons to tell us, right? Um, so uh, we were watching Age of Samurai uh, yesterday, and and then my girlfriend goes, "Oh, this is this is kind of like the Bible, you know? Like the, the there's like this guy Nobunaga is like uh, figures out that he can like sneak up and like kill this uh, other um, other guy, uh, and I think his name is Yamashito, and." Uh, and, and my girlfriend's like, yeah, this, this is like, this is like the Bible. Right. And I'm like, well, I think a lot the reason the Bible lasts for so long is it had a bunch of practical advice on what to do in battle. If you're a small, and if you're a small force, there's a much larger one, you got to just try to play dirty. Right. And kill the, like, <laughs> kill the head of that, um, head of that force. And I think the same is true, uh, with the Vedas, right? Like uh, the reason why they last is because like, there's always some practical lessons in there that are about human nature. Um, and, and it's a recording of that, right? And, and then similarly, like, uh, if you're familiar with the Chinese romance of the three kingdoms, right? Um, there's a reason why that novel is persisted for so long. There's so many lessons about humans and human character and ambition. Um, so I think that's, to me, that's what, uh, that's really the core of it, 
right? Just remembering that like people don't change, you know, corporate equity structures are just a different framing of like hero worship and loot of a different type. Like we are fundamentally, you know, yeah. we are just the, the same. I think, and also like, if we think about it in terms of a modern, like the modern framework of memes, right? So like, why does a certain meme become popular? And one of the things that I, uh, one of the things that I think about quite a lot, like I, I cannot get over it. Like it's such a big insight to me. I don't know how long ago I had it, but I think about it uh, way too much. It's simply, you know, like we're talking about 3000 years ago and, you know, like between five to 3000 years ago, there were a lot of, um, uh, we now know, uh, there are two concepts one long history so history is longer than we thought it was mm -hmm. and uh, it's so the, the current timelines might not necessarily hold right so even when i say three to five thousand years ago when you were talking about the bigness of time right like mm -hmm. what have we what are we the product of yeah. right and how do we so it, it goes further back but also to think that what can we broadly agree on we can broadly agree on the fact that three thousand years ago there were no modern affordances right so there were no there's no electricity and there's no safety or currency or whatever right and if you read the rig veda like and i'm going to focus on that because it's what i was listening to very recently um is just so there's a society forget where they're from and who they are etc there's a group of people and this is what they prize they're, they're mm -hmm. poets, like the rishis, and, and the word is also interesting, like Rug Veda, Rushi. The word Ru is related to knowledge, is the root word of it, mm -hmm. right? And above all, they prized knowledge. Mm -hmm. So if you're talking about Hinduism's contributions to the world, or what is the Hindu way of life, the pursuit and the articulation of knowledge was important at least 3,000 years ago, if not longer, mm -hmm. right? So these are poets, right? They are writing poetry, right? And what we would understand as poetry today. And uh, him is a okay, loose English analogy for it. We have our own Sanskrit word, sukta, right? And we have poetry about so many things. We have poetry about Soma, Agni, Indra, right? The, the night, Ratri Sukta, there is a mm -hmm. poetry about the night. And at some point, collectively, the society, and, and then of course, there's the question of, because we don't have a script from them, and this was a purely oral tradition, that alone should really twist your mind. Mm -hmm. Like, what the hell is it? are you saying that these people did all of this and they didn't have a written alphabet mm -hmm. like that that can't be true okay mm -hmm. so, and then what if it's true that they didn't have a written alphabet you have to reconfigure society entirely mm -hmm. right uh, and if they did have a written alphabet and it disappeared so a why did the alphabet disappear and why did these poems live on and b uh why did this society of all the challenges that they had in front of them war battle famine uh resources right like other tribes attacking them uh that this is what was important to them, that of all the things we are going to save, we are not going to save our idols, our temples, which they tried. We have mm -hmm. some, you know, we have some pottery from back in that day, mm -hmm. but they're like, no, this is what we will die for. Mm -hmm. Like to save the knowledge that we have gathered in the world and how the knowledge has been organized, right? Because the, the compilation of the Rig Veda is supposedly by this one guy who decided to structure the text in a certain way. Mm -hmm. Right. So like the, the Rig Veda is an anthology. It's not like a linear book. Yeah. So and then that's what they chose. And not only did they choose to preserve that, they're like, no, this is what we are going to base our life around mm -hmm. in such a big way that it goes on to inform the next 3000 years of society. Like anything mm -hmm. that you would consider to be a Hindu or a Hindu king is like, yep, they're the Brahmins. They're going to take care of the Vedas and they know what they're talking about. So let's let's say, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. that always boggles my mind. So th th this is what's fascinating, right? One is like writing really is just sort of a technology. You can do a lot with writing. And in fact, like, I mean, there's an, there's the um, a parallel in Islam as well, right? The hifs. So if you're, if you, uh, so there's sort of this memorization of the entire Quran, even if you have no idea what it's saying, right? Um, and that's something that like, once you, once you accomplish it, you're given the title of Hafiz and like, you know, that's like, that is a successful uh, thing. And so the, the, what's what's fascinating is like, and you mentioned this earlier too, that there's no that there's nobody um, a, who would call themselves a Hindu who doesn't recognize the importance of the Vedas, right? And I think importance is an interesting word because uh, you can recognize the importance of something, and but not recognize its divinity, right? Um, or vice versa, you can say something is divine but not important necessarily, right? Um, and this is a question that many. Uh, many religions struggle with. So like, uh, 
so again in the in the uh, islamic world right there's the idea of like is the quran the literal word of god or is it is it the word of god filtered through humanity and it's the best we can get but there is such a thing as the word of god and it is real we're just never going to get to it like these they seem like very technical discussions but they actually have really important meanings um and this is something that like the, the you know you, you mentioned there's this long tradition of, of people passing on this knowledge and it is passing on the knowledge but people also talked about it right so shankaracharya and like a bunch of these acharyas like they they all sat down and they were like wait a minute something in here doesn't quite add up you know and they and they go in and they kind of try to resolve logical uh, uh logical inconsistencies um or just like you know plot holes uh in the during the course of the uh of the storytelling it is like this sort of group project right um and i think that's the that's the second part of it right it's like once you put something at least back then writing was a technology and it was so expensive that like once you put it down i think people understood that like oh man it's gonna be really hard to change right um, and the and the oral tradition, I think, gave people the freedom they needed to actually like work things out, right, um, little by little, and then and arrive at like a group consensus of what this this should be, and then that passed down, and then eventually people were like, okay, I think we all agree on what this what the core is. Now let's write it down, right? Um, that, like that's that's the way I understand it at least, because every every religious text. That I've ever encountered uh, has a period at the beginning of its formation where people are just like, let's just sit here and figure out what actually goes in here. So, um, do you know about the Council of Nicaea? Yep. Yeah. So that's that's the one for the Bible. Um, have you heard of the Mihna? Uh, M I H N A. So the Mihna happened. It was basically like a. Um, it was basically like a. What is it called? The the thing in the. Inquisition. Um, it was basically like the Inquisition, but in Islam about like about the year like 800. Um, but it was the opposite, right? It wasn't saying you must accept the you must accept the Quran as the unequivocal divine work of God. It is that you must accept that the Quran is uh, is um, is a creation of mankind, right? And so and like that was a big thing that they were very firm on. And they persecuted a lot of people who accepted the Quran as divine, right? They were like, no, there's nothing divine in this world, right? That is the, like, that was a big portion of their, their thing. Um, and so these, these types of debates, they're just so like, they are really interesting. They're really like, you know, it's like right, as you, right when you pull out um, something from the forge, it's still hot and still moldable, right? And then like, as it cools, it just sort of like whatever shape it cools into, like it's gonna stay like that for some time. If you want to change it, you gotta hammer it quite a lot. Right. Um, so that's that's I think where I'm how I view a lot of this stuff. I mean, you just described the emergence of modern standards as mm -hmm. well as open source software. Yeah. Right. And like what do you call standards in the software industry today? Like, why is it a software? Like in like, you know, so like I have I have uh, seeing like a state and mythical man month in front of me. And all of them talk about patterns, patterns and anti-patterns, right? So that's that language. And I really love the phrase anti-pattern ever since I first uh, discovered it, right? Mm -hmm. And like, the, it, we apparently have been trying to do this forever. And, and, and I think like going back to the discussion about, like I, I was just Googling Mihna and, you know, I think one of the reasons that, because I often look into why is it important to us suddenly to trace it back to, because, you know, if 200 years ago, some guy came up and presented to me what the Vedas say and what this say, I would still be like, oh my God, holy shit, that's a, that's a great way to, to view the world and to structure society. Like a lot of, a lot of Vedas can just be taken as is, as they are, you know, um, uh, or, or the Mahabharata, like as the encapsulation of human behavior. Mm -hmm. But this, uh, this question of like, why is it, it become important is because funny enough, I feel like it's quite reactionary. It's modern Hinduism that's become reactionary after the Islamic invasions, the British colonialism, as well as, you know, the modern political Dravidian movement, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, the divide and conquer strategy that was applied to us. Because I think it is the opposite. I think it is the church that claims to be the first, that Islam has a very strong claim to be the first. And you don't really see that. Like, I don't think Adi Shankaracharya went around saying that, you know, Hinduism came first, right? Because mm -hmm. by then, Buddhists already existed. 
he was mm -hmm. arguing with them as well. Mm -hmm. And then what's also fascinating is the fact that like Shankaracharya also lived roughly like a thousand years after like Rig Veda's existence, right? Yeah. So yeah. who knows what, and, and then you have that, you have like whatever the hell Shankaracharya is up to and whatever he establishing the Mats and the Acharyas and the Gurukuls. But in parallel, you have, you know, around 800 to 1000, the first Islamic invasion of that, you know, the Hindu landmass mm -hmm. and, and begins, right? It is around one, somewhere between 800 and 1000 that the first invasions start coming in. And uh, in parallel, you have like kings in India who seem to not talk to each other. Like that's mm -hmm. something that really puzzles me. And one of the things that I haven't figured out is what was the influence of people like Adi Shankaracharya in the material concerns of the people that day? Because we're trying to answer the question, mm. what is the role of Hinduism? What does it give to you in your everyday life? Right? So like, yeah. I can yeah. give you many trite words like, okay, we love nature, you know, worship your parents, be nice to people. Uh, there's this concept called karma. So don't do bad or bad will come to you, you know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, but beyond that, like, I I don't know how to say, like, I can talk to you about traditions, like, you know, the importance of studying, the importance of knowledge is quite central to India, right? Like, mm -hmm. yeah, okay. Yeah, there's Our a reason why so many of us are in software and so many of us particularly are at a company like Google, which it's the, the it's mission statement is organize the world's information. <laughs> like, it's, 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 it's really, it's really very, very funny, right? I, uh, I mean, it, we've been doing that for 3000 years. Yeah. It's a tradition as rich as anybody else, you know, like yeah. when I say we, in this case, I'm referring specifically to Brahmins, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, like, okay, you know, we get the criticism, we, you know, we get the criticism that we do. We, we're not even a part of it. It's, it's bizarre. Like I grew up in Mumbai, you know, I, I'm the least Brahmin person in the world. But what do you call it? Like if for 3000 years, your family has held a certain set of values. Mm -hmm. And nobody, you talk to anybody in my family, my grandfather, they don't know each other. Like my grandfather, there was an arranged marriage, right? Mm -hmm. Between my parents. And but if you went and spoke to my grandfathers individually, their opinion on the importance of knowledge in the world and your life and education mm -hmm. would be exactly the same. One yeah. guy was a farmer, the other guy was a teacher. They didn't speak the same language. One guy spoke Gujarati, the other guy spoke Hindi. Mm -hmm. They came from entirely different cultures, like Gujarat and like close to Agra or whatever. Yeah. But opinion on the world, and I, and I bet if a Brahmin from the northernmost corner of India goes to meet a Brahmin from Kerala or Tamil Nadu, they will have far more in common than, yeah. you know, like yeah. on the ways of looking at the world. Well, so, I, I think that gets back to your whole thing about why didn't kings talk to each other? Because kings yeah. weren't expected to talk to each other, right? Like, so like, like no matter what, in Indian society, there are, there's sort of like these, um, there, there are these scattered groups and there's these scattered networks. Like, like you know, um, uh, my friend, my friend is Cuban. And she says, and she they have she has this term cubiquity, which is the idea that there are Cubans everywhere, no matter where you go, there are Cubans, right? And like the truth is, you could probably say that about almost any group in the modern world because everybody has scattered to the to the edges of the world, right? Modi like went somewhere and was like, ah, oh, there's Gujaratis here. Of course, there are Gujaratis here. You know, there's Gujarat, there's Gujaratis everywhere. Um, and but I think that that happened in India a very long time ago, which is a group scattered. Um, across the country, but maintained some vague sense of network with each other, right? And and I think that like that was a communication bit, like the way that like culture transmitted was not by with kings meeting each other and passing policies with each other. It's like merchants and uh, priests and um, and musicians and whoever and storytellers and of various types and like. India just also has this large indigenous population, right? Uh, sorry, it's uh, itinerant population. Um, people who, you know, who move from group, from uh, region to region to region, and that's just their life, they're nomads, right? Um, and and they also are responsible for transmission of messages and, and, and packages and various things. So like the, that's, to me, that's what's very interesting is that there's this, um, uh, there's this like, just very different, layering of society right yeah. um and and do people that was intentional i don't so this is yeah this is one thing that I, I i i would love to talk about i think i could talk about this for for an hour which is like i don't think it was intentional so the current evidence tells us that india started sort of segregating along caste lines and like there's one way that caste manifests the most which is marriage right like nearly every other rule you can come up with about caste gets violated at some point, but like marriage is the thing that people really care about.
like there are places where like you know brahmins will have food cooked by other castes and other castes will have food cooked by brahmins but whatever like the the um the whatever the hierarchy is the like the rules can flip around um but marriage is the thing that stays consistent and i think around 1900 years ago is is when the Mauryan empire went through its collapse right and i think after the collapse of a centralized authority like that um like i think basically if if people get if people rely on centralized authority and then develop trade links and they're like oh it's okay we can go safely wherever well let's build up habits around this idea and then they get used to a certain supply chain right and then that centralized empire collapses right um and then now nobody can guarantee the safety of anything anymore question is okay who do you cling to right and how do you cling to people safely again and i think that is that that that's and basically the the caste segregation is a big portion of uh like i think yeah i think marriage segregation is basically how that uh came about as a result of that um that collapse which could happen today too you know if the u.s collapses i'm willing to bet that like <laughs> like if the, if the u.s collapses and like people can't ship stuff anymore you're gonna see yeah. all sorts of weird alliances and weird networks form up right yeah. um because people still want to get their goods to market you know people still want to have markets um, yeah. That's what human beings have wanted to do since like time immemorial, right? So like that's yeah. So, but which also like so that's interesting, right? So like the hypothesis and I'm not the hypothesis. Like I know that there are people who strongly they have strong evidence for these things called temple economies, right? Mm. So like we don't we didn't have bazaars. So, like the bazaar is like seems to be a Middle Eastern concept, mm -hmm. uh, but we seem to have like in Hinduism or like Hindu culture or civilization, we had that's how trade was carried out. Like it was temple to temple, field to field, king to king. Yeah. But also, uh, you know, and what I meant by like, whether the kings talk to each other, but while I think that you're right, uh, you know, what I'm referring to specifically is, for example, what I'm trying to figure out is what was the, like church and state, right? Church mm. and state, like what was the division and how did it actually work? Because mm. for example, like uh, the, the clearest written correspondences that we have are between the Rajput kings, right? Mm. And basically, the Rajput story is a story of betrayal and like, mm. uh, you know, very, very uh, extremely, what is, there's a really nice word in, word in English for it. Uh, pastoral? No, I'm looking for a word that indicates like rural, you know, like th these folks, they weren't really into like evolving, like they mm. were like medieval, uh, like European greedy people, you know, like they didn't really care about the advancement Feudal. of society. Feudal yeah. is one way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, so, and so anyway, so like there were some Rajput alliances, including Rajput betrayals, and you can see that they write to each other and there's like family ties, right? Like they had this Biradri structure, like very, very mm -hmm. tribal, right? And then, uh, and, and they had this Jagi structure, right? So like this land holdings are given to you. But, uh, what is fascinating is not that there was like intra Rajput betrayal, it is that. At some point, I think between the 12th and the 16th century, when one of the Rajput kings was getting absolutely slaughtered, that a South Indian Hindu king was at the height of his power, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And it's almost like it's almost like they didn't even know that the other person existed. Mm -hmm. Like it's very very strange. Like it's not like there are Tamil or Telugu kings who are like, oh yeah, we have our whoever, not brothers, mm -hmm. but you know, like there is no like our 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 fellow Hindus. None of that exists, yeah. and that always has been like a gaping hole, like like black hole like what what yeah. what's going on there like how do we do they or you know then i begin to wonder because a, a lot of association was you know one of my favorite questions is do hindus think of themselves as hindus 500 years ago 1000 years ago right yeah. like did adi shankaracharya go around saying yeah i'm a hindu yeah probably not right like he called himself an advaitin or he had mm -hmm. a word for himself or some sort of an acharya belonging yeah. to a certain school you know so what did identity form around so they had the concept of a desh which were like these local king had their own yeah. countries, you know. But you know, it's weird. It's like this complete lack of like what is outside my desh. It really boggles my mind. Yeah. There seems to be like this Indo-Greek like shape of ancient thought that I talked about in the previous talk. Mm -hmm. And then there's like some sort of collapse. You have no idea what the hell is going on. Uh, you have a couple. Of, you have you have the Satvahanas and like kingdoms like that that are huge. They still have their monuments left. Mm -hmm. And then there's like a completely. <sighs> A thousand years of no knowledge and then the invasions start and everything that we know today seems to be made up of these invasions like yeah. our reaction to those invasions you know so, so i really don't know how to think about that so i uh, there's there's a couple of 
Um, yeah, so I want to make a point about the invasions, right? Like I always think of it in terms of geography and geopolitics. And so to me, the like the 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 beginning of the Islamic invasions is just a continuation of the Central Asian invasions, right? Like to me, those are the same thing. Um, it's just like now they had a different banner to unite under, they had different philosophy perhaps, but also kind of not. Like it's not exactly like if you read the Islamic chronicles from like the 1200s that are criticizing the Central Asians, they're like, these people aren't Muslim at all. They're, they do some really weird shit. Like they're not Muslim. They claim to be, but they're really not, right? So I think a big portion of it too is that like when we talk about the Muslim invaders, especially from Afghanistan and like uh, Turkestan, the other, uh, other Turkic parts of Central Asia, what I, what, what's happening often is that these are people who are not at the center of knowledge in their own domain necessarily, like in their own thing. So they, they show up and then, um, and then they like, you know, settle down and they become dormant kings. And they're like, wait a minute, there's a lot, of, I, have, I have a lot of questions, you know? <laughs> and, then that's when, and I think they, they kick off a lot of scholarship. And I think like, this is the interesting, I mean, like Akbar is a great example of this, right? And we're like, but uh, there's a lot of these uh, invaders who kind of get, um, who start, who invade because they are at the periphery of knowledge, right? And so like they're, they are driven, yes, by bringing markets and supply chains and loot and all of that stuff for themselves. Um, but I'm, I'm very much a believer in that, like nearly every human being does crave knowledge. Um, they just haven't been taught to create, they, they haven't been taught that that is a hunger you can feed, right? Um, and that is like a pattern you see with, with, many, with many invaders. So that's, that's, that's number one. But the, the part that connects to it is like, you look at the way that Central Asia relates to South Asia and Central Asia relates to West Asia, right? Which is that um, there, there are, have been many invasions from Central Asia into like Iran and uh, into the, the modern Arab world, right? Like the Mongols did it um, and, the, uh, and, and Tamerlan did it. And a bunch of these guys went and wrecked, wrecked stuff there too. And they were, they were Muslims as well. There was just like, it was Muslim on Muslim conflict, right? But what's interesting is the Iranians have a very different idea of how knowledge should be stored, right? Um, so I think we might have I, we, we might have touched, touched on this on a Twitter thread a while back, but specifically like the Sasanian Empire and uh, even the pre-Islamic Iranian empires uh, believed that like the king had to have a library, like the most important thing for the king to have was a central library, and that knowledge had to be under the under the um, blessing of the king, right? Um, which is a very interesting, a very different ideology than what was happening in India at the time which was a very intentional um, separation of the, uh, the knowledge that is maintained and the, the traditional stuff that is maintained and the, um, and the actual uh, thing that the uh, king does, right? The whole idea, I think, of, of the Indian structure is, yeah, you know what? Kings come and go. Like this guy, he'll be a king now. And then like, you know, maybe he'll get knocked over and then his next generation will be, will be considered untouchables. Right, like whatever the, the like that that was considered the, an acceptable cycle, right? Um, but the knowledge has to stay the same. Oh, you you muted, by the way. No, and speaking of one of the hardest truths for people to accept is that in in three thousand years of recorded Indian history, ninety nine percent of the kings were not savarna as they would consider yeah. savarna. That's correct. It's yeah. a very strange. What it's so bizarre, it blows my mind when Americans or even Indians talk about caste politics so confidently. And I'm like, you cannot, you want to talk about power, you are not accounting for actual power structures, right? right. Like, wh who held the power? Where was the power? Yeah. Where was the, who held the lands, the armies, the material wealth? You know, it's very, it's a very strange way of looking at history. And I'm, I, I know that there's a lot to be reconciled, but you cannot start with really poisoned priors. <laughs> so, the, the, so the the you asked me to read City of Darkness, right? Yes. Um, King Ruin like City it? of Darkness. I loved it. Um, yeah. uh, specifically, like the questions of like when does one enter history and when does one exit it, right? Um, exactly. And and to me, uh, and I think I've made tweets to this uh, to this effect before. Um, the way I now understand Indian history is kings are people who are still in history, right? And Brahmins have removed themselves from history. Like that, that is the, that, that is, that is one way that you can read that political structure or that, that societal structure is that a bunch of people were like, Hey, I don't, I don't want to fight. You know, you guys, you guys do your game of tag, you guys do your thing, but like, we're not, we're not involved and we're going to yeah. 
we're going to we're going to incorporate and inculcate a bunch of practices that signal very strongly that we are yeah. out of the game, right? Yeah. Um, and and that is theoretically how it's supposed to work, but like I'm not sure that that actually happened, right? Because there were like in Vijayanagara Empire, uh, there were uh, generals um, for military generals who were Brahmin who yeah. were working alongside military generals who were what we would consider today to be Dalit, but were yeah. perhaps not Dalit back then, yeah. right? Um, and and so like they, they had a you, you know the, the <laughs> there's always the there's always the like theoretical structure and then you actually go read practical stuff and, and you're right, just exactly. like no no all you all you historical people you're doing history wrong we know what yeah. you're supposed to be doing <laughs> and yeah I mean you don't have to you don't have to there is no like alternative scholarship I'm reading here I'm literally reading the same scholarship that they're reading and I'm like are you not seeing the same thing I'm seeing yeah but but like going back to like you know Hindu practices and not like and also one thing I wanted to remark is, you know, so we talked about, so, so just to like recap a little bit, we talked about who the Indus Valley civilization were, the Aryans who came in, ancient kings, um, connection of Hindu society with these kings, and you have the invasions and how Hindu society has become reactionary. And then randomly, you have like Sushruta, right? He's like, yeah, okay, I'm going to invent surgery. Like, cool, right? And we have it, we have his texts till today. It's it's astounding. Like this is not, you know, like, so there are these WhatsApp forwards about Sanskrit is the oldest language in the world, right? Okay, whatever. Sure. Ha ha. WhatsApp forwards, WhatsApp university. You can make fun of your elderly parents as much as you want. You still have to account for Sushruta, right? What are you going to say? Like, and, 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 and is that any less incredible or marvelous or astounding? Forget Sushruta. There's a freaking Kerala school of mathematics. Why are there a bunch of people doing mathematics in the middle of all this? Like, you know, there's chaos, there's wars, there's famines, but here's a bunch of people who are like, math is great, and we're going to sit, and we're going to do mathematics, and it's going to be amazing, right? And none of it is like, you know, uh, back in the day, like, if you look at who was doing mathematics before that, the Greeks, right? So, like, we were also doing mathematics, but what is interesting also in that is uh, the Hindus seem to not care about geometry that much, like we the only thing that we care about geometry is when we are doing altar construction right so like the classic okay you put it yeah. at this angle so, so I, I don't know where where you read that I, I i've read that a couple of times and i actually disagree um like there's actually evidence of uh hindus caring a lot about geometry when it comes to architecture and specifically um, yes uh, like yeah like and, and not just specifically altars it is also like um so a common form of warfare about 500 years ago was uh, so when you make a when you make a reservoir you need a hard clay uh, thing and then it's okay to have soft clay under that but the hard clay keeps the water from seeping into the porous soil underneath right and uh, a very common way that like medieval conquerors in India would come and fuck up each other's shit is just like they would take a giant lance and they would try to pierce it into the reservoir, right? Like, like I'm talking like a 12 foot yeah. lance, pierce it into the reservoir and then break the hard soil. And then the water starts to drain. And then that settlement becomes untenable after that, right? Yeah. So making making hard, uh, so, so making reservoirs and like making these settlements where like uh, you have water that can sustain people for a really long time. Um, that, was a, that was a school of like, that was a, that was a set of disciplines that people and specifically kings invested in a lot as like a competitive right. technology against each other and um, what's fascinating is that sort of stuff like so first of all i didn't know that so thank you i had no idea that that was a thing but what that reminded me of is think about the material technology right so like materials engineering that they had to do so like composition of materials and there is no record either of who was the keeper of such knowledge right? yeah so, so there's like uh, there's a bunch of sculptors. Do you know of this tribe that rings the stones and listens to the stones? Have you heard of them? I've heard of them. Yeah, yeah. But I yeah. think on, on some on some documentary on some Telugu TV yeah, channel. Yeah, so they're dying out now. But it's a bunch of people who can basically knock on a stone and hear it and realize whether it's good for sculpting and give you pretty accurate properties, right? It's knowledge that's been passed down for hundreds of years, hundreds of years in India. But they're not they're not caste specific. It's a tribe. They're not yeah. caste specific. Yeah. And similarly. Uh, if you go to like, so we're talking about maths, but like in the geometry thing, you're right. It's not only altar construction, it's also astronomy, right? So for astronomy, it was the, the geometry and the angles were super like important to them. Uh, but I guess, okay, so like, what I, maybe you can say that the Greeks laid much more emphasis on it and we seem to be much more about like, 
you know, when we're chanting, you want the chants to go in a certain pattern and the mandala should have certain shapes or whatever. Uh, sure. But the point is that we were doing it back then. <laughs> like, and yeah. out of nowhere, this Sushruta emerges and the Kerala school emerges. And why? Like, what led to those factors, you know? Yeah. I think part of, part of what... Um... I think I am very much a Marxist in a lot of my historical explanations, which is like, so Sushruta in particular was able to learn how to do that surgery because there was one king who was like super uh, enthusiastic about chopping off people's noses, right? Um, and and so like, it's like, it's almost like a supply thing. It's like, once you have a supply of people, you're like, whoa, okay, I guess I can practice a whole bunch, right? Um, and you see this even in like modern Indian medicine where like some of the um, some of the world's best surgeons on these very narrow, like pediatric cardiac specialties um, are sitting in India, right? Because like the, there's just a lot of people who have that particular defect and they come in and these, and these surgeons do the surgery. And so they might've done like 8,000 surgeries um, by the time they're 40 or 50 and somebody equivalent in the West has done maybe 400, right? Um, just because of the numbers of, uh, of India. So I think that's like, that's a portion of it, right? It's like people, people, there were product managers back then who were getting excited about like the market. Um, who were like, ah, oh, I got product market fit. Like it's, it's excellent. Though to be fair, uh, Sushita's surgery is a services oriented business. So um, <laughs> it's very, very different story. Um, but yeah, I think that that's, that that's at least a part of what I'm seeing, um, which is that people like, uh, or what I'm hearing in you, in you saying is like, listen, we've been inventive, right? We've been inventive and curious yeah. about the world and like recording the stuff for like quite some time. Um, and, and like, to me, that's such a great way of like continuing to honor the tradition. Like in some ways, uh, some days when I'm like really phoning it in, phoning it in at work, you know, and I'm not doing very well. I just tell myself, oh, but it's okay. I'm continuing to the, I'm continuing the long-standing tradition of expanding humanity's knowledge, right? Like that's that, like it's okay. I, I I might not have done today very well, but like on a on a millennial scale, like I'm going in the right direction. Yeah, you know? um, yeah. Roughly, I don't know. I don't know. Like on a broad scale, I don't know how to think about it. Uh, and how do you view like? Do you have, how do you, what do you think of, what do you think of, uh, what's the word, uh, es eschat es I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but es eschatology. eschatology. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. Es yeah, eschatology. Do you, yeah. do you then believe in the, do you believe in this idea of the Kali Yuga and Kalki and the emergence and? Yeah, you know, I don't know. I, I think that like people, people say that a lot to, to give up trying. Like people who want to give up trying say, oh, whatever, we're in the end times anyway. You know, um, and and I think that's a you know um, that and there's similar constructs in other religions, right? To be like the world has fallen, and there's nothing we can do. Like the, the, the Adam and Eve, right? It's like oh no, look, we've fallen out of the Garden of Eden. We're full of sin. That is uh, that that is how it is. And and I think what's interesting about that that general construction of like yeah, we're towards the end times. Things are getting worse anyway. Is like um, it. It's a very like, um, it's soothing, isn't it? To be like, ah, see, there's a, the, there, this is all gonna end and then things are gonna get a lot better. But they're gonna get a lot better for who exactly? Like, um, there's this great book called Revolt of the Public. Uh, and it covers a bunch of the mass movements that were like, that went on on the internet uh, or were facilitated by the internet, right? And um, the guy says like, even when you see like streets full of people protesting, you're maybe seeing like two to three percent of the population, right? And like sometimes in rare instances, you might see 10 percent of the population. That's really rare. But like the thing is that most people are still kind of not represented in that bulk of protesters, no matter what the protest is. Um, and you can say they speak for whatever, for, for other people or whatever. But the most like the, the most um, difficult way to understand our society is that uh, understand human society is that we are we are always privileging one group of people and and almost always screwing another right and what happens in history is that this shifts like and this and and this you know and this is again getting back to a very marxist view of of history but what i, I guess what i'm trying to bring it back to is that it really is uh uh Kali Yuk for some people right it and it really isn't for others right it's ram raja for yeah. other people 
right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. No, so and, that's that's also the missing gap in that theory, right? The, yeah. the cosmology of the Hindu universe. Yeah. There is no geographical indicator. That's the point. Yeah. And that kind of sucks. Like when you're talking about dharma, right? Mm-hmm. Can your dharma be performed only on the sacred lands of India? You know, yeah. in, in, in Hinduism, we have the concept of sacred geography. Yeah. So, yeah. but 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 if Aryans came from the friggin' Caucasus, yeah. does our sacred geography extend to there? Is is the whole world, is the world confined to geographical boundaries or? No, no, bro. They they that? they became holy be once they crossed the Sindhu. Yeah, yeah, they got the and they got the, and they got the Tarud, and that's when they, uh, you know, that's that's when they became. Uh, they took a holy. dip in the Ganga. They took a dip in the Ganga. And that's yeah, what exactly. Happened. That's that's what happened. Yeah. Well, I mean, like uh, you know, we're we're laughing about it, but this was also uh, there was some famous figure in the 1800s. Was it was it Vivekananda who had to get a special exception to leave India because there was like for for his particular dharma there's this idea that you're not supposed to cross river across water like once you cross water you're no longer uh, a Hindu right um I'll have I've to figure heard, out sorry this the uh, so I have been asking this for for a decade now and the consensus answer seems to be this seems to be a modern invention like mm. they, they, just, they just came up with it in the 16th or 17th century randomly yeah. It has no scriptural basis per se, and we've never heard of it before. And in fact, in fact, quite the opposite, the idea of going and traveling. We just didn't travel. It also like, did Indians not travel? Why is there no Indian Marco Polo? Mm. Like, why is there no Indian Fa, that Fa Tien or whatever the Chinese guy was, you know? Yeah. Like he was like roaming around South Indian temples in like the fifth century, right? And like, yeah. we were Indians are so happy there. We were just like, man, this is great. We don't need to go anywhere. Great weather. Yeah. Like, India was basically like California at that time, if you think about it. <laughs> yeah. and, like, except all of India, you know, like the temperatures yeah. kind of temperate, there's fertile soil. Uh, but yeah, so, like, I, I asked you that question is because uh, I love, I, I saw this tweet today and I loved it so much. You know, we fight against each other, but the real battle is against entropy, right? Mm. That's right. the real battle for all of humanity. And uh, the real battles are against aging, for example, if you're Balaji, it's it's his thing, and mm-hmm. there's people working on that. And um, and here we are, and we're fighting each other. But but if you take and you know, the whole Abrahamic religions are kind of centered around the idea that you want to die so you can usher in a better world, right? Mm-hmm. And a loose analogy is, you know, when Skulki comes and the wheel of time, which is also a Hindu concept, the wheel mm-hmm. of time is a Hindu concept, uh, that it starts again, that it has to start again, right? And mm-hmm. you just and. It's actually really, really black pilling if you think about it, because yeah. the, the Kali Yuga describes a time when it is impossible to be dharma. Yeah. There is nothing yeah. you can do. It it takes individual will away from you, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and then that's it. Then Kalki has to emerge, and time has to end, and we begin, you know. And Shiva yeah. begins to dance. So I don't know how to view those things, but for now, at least we are at the start of it. So there's a long, long way to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think. Um, yeah, I man. I, I I really want to tease this for the next episode, but um, have you heard? Have you read a book called Ishmael? No. So Ishmael tries to give a sort of rationalist uh, rationalist uh, retelling of the story of Adam and Eve, of how like essentially we did kind of live in a world of plenty, and then we fucked it up because we just like got too greedy and we ate too much of it, and then we tried to like tame it. And then we messed it up. And then agriculture is the kind of thing that like doomed us. And this is, and you know, Harari and Diamond, a bunch of thinkers agree with this type of uh, thing, right? But the book Ishmael kind of lays this out. Um, and I think similarly, like when you, when you said that, it's like, oh, there's nothing you can do to be dharmic. I was like, wow, that reminds me of trying to be vegetarian in America, right? In the 90s, right? It's just like, it was impossible. And, and I didn't have the vocabulary to say it back then, but I was just like, I was trying to do real right by it. But like, it's very clear now looking back that like we were just torturing ourselves. Like our family was like trying so hard to get nutritious vegetables and survive in like winter, right? In like the Northeast of the US. And it's just like, we should just be like, yeah, this is a place that we can't do this. <laughs> you know, like the, our chance of living out whatever like tradition thing is, it's, it's not possible here. Um, and so I think that, uh, that like, I think about that a lot. And, and specifically, like, I think of a lot of this wheel of time stuff, not in the sense of like epic, um, you know, all of humanity type of things, but they can even happen within your own life, right? Like there are, you go through little little wheels in your own life. And then there's times where you just have no option. You cannot be the person you want to be, 
right? And like eventually that ends in destroying whatever scenario it was yeah. that like made you be that way. And then you have to start again and be like, okay, well, I guess I have to like figure out what I want to get right this time around. Um, one of my favorite retellings of the Ramayana is uh, when it's actually like a, it's like a, it's like a framing around the story, which is where like a ring is dropped and Hanuman has to go chase after the ring. And then he goes down to the underworld, right? And Yama is there and Yama is like, oh, Hanuman, you've arrived. Um, do you know, uh, do, do you have time for a story? And Hanuman's like, no, I have to get the ring. I have to get the ring. You, you have to give me this. And Yama's like, no, 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 you have time for a story. Let me tell you a story. And then he tells a new version of the Ramayana, right? Yeah. And you're yeah. and like and Hanuman's like that's not how it goes that's that's not how it is now just give me the ring and then like Yama like kind of opens it up and shows like a pile of rings of all yeah. the times that it has gone before and he's yeah. like okay which one do you want right yeah and, and like that's that's how it ends and you're just like holy shit what the but, that's, but that's the matrix right? yeah like it's the matrix is but it, okay so if you're talking about contribution to Hinduism I'll get to that but just one small point the revolt of the public I really want to read that book. But you know this, right, probably as well, that um, there, is a, there is a story that we tell ourselves. And stories are so important. Like the, the central importance of the story in our lives is, you know, when people say, like, how can you call the Mahabharata a story? And I'm like, it is the central story of all our lives. Mm -hmm. Like uh, uh, Stories are very important. You know, stories are not minor things that you can discard, right? They run your life. Like as a human being, there is a story you're telling yourself. But the story in uh, that is popularly said is, uh, evil oppression, rise of the masses, and that's where Marx is. He, Marx mm -hmm. loses me. I think Marx has contributed something fantastic to historical material analysis, right? Mm -hmm. Like the analysis of story in terms of where the power is distributed is such a simple but profound question, mm -hmm. uh, and I love it. I love it. Except most Marxists are I meet are quite stupid. That's that's my problem, right? They're like very stupid people. So, uh, and then they have this thing that okay, oppression, masses rise, good times, right? However, uh, I think a bunch of people did a study and they found out that I think in something like 80% of the revolutions that they had actual data on, the elites did not change even after the revolution. Yeah. So the people who were powerful just continued to be powerful, right? They, they, they sort of like made themselves part of the protests somehow and then they somehow came, on, came out on top, right? Yeah. Uh, and somehow after every revolution, their position was even more entrenched, mm -hmm. right? So that's something that most people don't realize when they talk about revolution, you know, whatever. Uh, but but coming down to like what Hinduism has contributed, if you talk about the matrix, like if you think about the stories of the Bible or the or the Quran or or or, or even the, the the well, you know, Jewish uh, the Jewish beliefs are actually quite complicated, right? Yeah. So they cannot be neatly labeled as Abrahamic, but Christian and uh, Quranic beliefs are quite linear. There is a creation myth. There is an interlude of evil and sin, and then there's an end and there's a rise to heaven or hell, right? So it's a very simple branch, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas Hinduism is, it's living in its own universe. Like you have this guy, Yoga Vashishta, and he says in a line, your, your universe is not my universe, mm. like reflecting on identity. And uh, the, Im the implication of that statement is so profound. And Hinduism is very, very comfortable with fractals. It doesn't actually care to be like, yeah, there's a structure, sure, if you want to make one. There's a structure there, too. One is not important than the other, you know. But make sure you observe. Like, that seems to be, like, a, a running theme in any Hindu text. Were you aware? Did you observe? Did you pay attention? Mm -hmm. Right? And you can see that right from the Rig Veda onwards, right? Like, if you see Usha, like the description of the dawn goddess, right, and that became a goddess later, the dawn is described in minute detail. This is the dawn, it rises, here is the dew on the grass, you know? And throughout, you, you see this trend everywhere, this almost compulsive need to describe in great detail your universe, you know? Oh yeah, so yeah. I know. My, my dad does that every time he drives. Like like every time he drives, he's like, <laughs> yeah. every single like, every yeah. single thing. And I'm like, I know, I see it too. You don't need to tell me. <laughs> I, think, I think that's just Brahmin autism, you know, in some ways. He's like, yeah. you know, but, uh, but if that's something that we've, and I think if, if there is any distinction to be made of a Hindu identity, that seems to be a promising line of inquiry. You know, mm -hmm. like, okay, we seem to have this need and we seem to not really care that much about 
definitions just the way like Christians would do. We are arguing. There are very technical arguments, but they're not arguing about the same thing. They say, like, this is what the way of looking at the world seems to be fundamentally different. Mm -hmm. This is one world among many. There are yeah. no health. There is Pata Lok and there are Loks and there are thousands and millions of them. There is no life. You are one life in a chain of many lives. Yeah. Where uh, you go is up to you, you know? It, uh, this, this is a bit kumbaya for me, but there's one interpretation, which is like, you know, the circle, the wheel of time. Um, circles are actually like, when you, when you zoom in enough, they are infinitely connected lines, right? Yeah. And so within like the circle is like as many linear narratives as you want. Um, but you're never going to escape the circle and maybe you're never going to escape a linear narrative either. But like, I, that, that's, that, that it's, it's one of those like moments where it's like, oh, I guess all religions are true type of, you know, type of feeling. And, um, which is like, it's Absolutely. just like the scale that you're looking at. Right. Um, and, and that's what a, other, and what, and now it's important to contrast what other belief system has this. I can't yeah. think of another one. There yeah, is yeah. no way of looking at the world that says, yeah, yeah, this makes sense. But like in the Mahabharata, right? So one of the lines in the Mahabharata is, if it is not contained here, it does not exist. Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't contain anywhere else. The story is about human lives in the book. And it does. You, you could take Yudhishthir from there and write an entire book on Yudhishthir. You could take Duryodhan from there and write an entire book on Duryodhan. And they would be going through their own individual hero's journeys. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yudhishthir falls, gambles his wife sort of redeems himself in war, becomes a good king, you know. Mm -hmm. Duryodhan, who is never actually Duryodhan in the texts, he's always called Suryodhan, he's an incredible man, you know. Mm. In spite of doing everything right, in spite of being the rightful inheritor of his lands, just keeps collapsing, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Uh, he's following his dharma and yet he is led into... Yeah. So, uh, and yeah, nobody, I... uh, nobody has resolved the contradiction for me between does, does Hinduism believe in the idea of free will? We both seem to and don't seem to. <laughs> yeah, well, I think that's that's the difficulty of trying to be like, yep, this is this, this is the canonical set of beliefs, right? Yes, like what, yeah. we've, what, what we've talked about so far, too, has been very much towards the text. And I think there's like there's sort of another layer of Hinduism out there, which is like folk beliefs, which are like, you know, my family tells a lot of stories and like those and, and I'm like, I hear those stories and I'm like, none of those characters are from the Vedas exactly. Like there's references mm. to one or two characters, right? But there's like, like my family has a story about, um, about, the, about the Buddha that's like really important, right? And I'm like, were we Buddhists like 800 years ago? I don't know, <laughs> yeah, like, like it'd, be, it'd be nice to know some of these things, right? Um, but I think there's another, like the, the, this, the, the text that we've talked about so far, I think are, are, are important and they're big. And then there's again, like to me, like the stock matter. There's other stuff, which is like, yeah. People talk about in like, you know, they, they'll tell stories and it informs people's morality and, and that type of thing. Um, but they're not necessarily written down and, and, and treated the same way. Um, so it's just I, think like, what you, I, I think what your parents have an, have an ancestral memory of arguing with Buddhists. That's what they're <laughs> you know? And also like, uh, dude, Buddhism was a CIA PSYOP. <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think Buddhism is real. Oh my God, no. Okay, we need to, okay. I love that, I love that. We got to do that next time. Buddhism was a CIA psyop. That's episode three, right? Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, All right. dude. Thank you so much, man. This um, was a lot of fun. It was great to stay somewhat on topic this time. So, you know, that was cool. There's a lot to talk about. You could, yeah. and you, like you said, we could talk about it for hours because the more you talk, the more questions come up. And yeah. often it is worth spending the time needed to even come to alignment on the terms. Yeah, Absolutely. Awesome. Semantic alignment is key. You know, all product managers know that. <laughs> <laughs> all right, dude. Thanks Will so do. much. See you. Bye. See you.